Welcome to Comics Bazaar, the channel of comics commentary and arcana. This video features Daredevil number 188, cover dated November 1982. The cover is by Frank Miller. It's a very eye-catching cover, very striking. We've got the Widow's Web design there and the Black Widow uh, sitting atop uh, Daredevil's back. But interesting art technique here where it looks like Miller is using some form of white media um, some kind of white paint in order to paint in the links of the web and also playing around with um, eliminating holding lines on Black Widow herself and Daredevil 2. So an interesting cover, everything by Frank Miller there, no Klaus Janssen involved. Now let's open this one up to the splash page and the splash page gives us our title of the story, The Widow's Bite and creative team Frank Miller writer and storyteller, Klaus Janssen penciler and inker and colorist. And we're going to get a little explanation in the, at the back of the book. There is no letters page, but there is an explanation of the change in credits that began with issue 185, where Janssen was credited as penciler for the first time and Miller only as storyteller. But the way I explain it is that Miller's providing um, thumbnail roughs for Klaus Janssen which he is using as guides for his pencils. So the visual storytelling is Miller's, but all of the details and finishes are Janssen's. So let's continue here. And what we get from this splash page is action. And the very classic Frank Miller layout of the full horizontal panels. And we've got Black Widow going up against, well, it's Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. in fact, but she's determined not to um, while away the week that she has left to her. Um, in the care of S.H.I.E.L.D. She wants to go out and find her own way out of having been poisoned, apparently fatally poisoned by the hand so that uh, she stepped on some foot spikes and they uh, were the means of a toxin entering her uh, system and it seems that it's going to kill her within a week unless she can find a cure. So really cool fight choreography on these particular pages. Let's continue with the story. Well, she makes her way to uh, a friend of hers, a colleague, um, this guy Ivan. He shows up, by the way, in Uncanny X-Men 268, the one that features the first meeting of Captain America and Logan in the summer of 1941. And he's there as a guardian figure for a very young Natasha Romanoff. And he's there watching Casablanca on the TV, and um, he's a bit of a sentimental type. So it gets to him. It, uh, uh, squeezes a tear from his eye, so to speak, and then Natasha falls right inside his window. So he asks her, obviously, what's up with her? We've been side by side since Stalingrad, he says, and I've never seen you take a spill. So since World War II, I wasn't poisoned in Stalingrad, she says. Poisoned, he asks. He's got a look of surprise and alarm on his face, and then she explains about the foot spikes. There's really good work here. This um, close-up three-quarter profile on Black Widow looks very good indeed. Nice use of a screen tone there as well by Jansen. Um, and she explains to Ivan, I'm on the run from the agency. The colonels ordered me to sit tight and let his boys investigate the situation. So Ivan counsels her, maybe she should, but she says, you know me better than that. So she says, look, there's nothing for you to do, Ivan. I love you like a father. So he is her surrogate father. Um, but there's nothing you can do. Look, the agents will check here for me next. I have to go. And he says to her, you can't do it alone, kid. I don't intend to, she says, as she somersaults out of his apartment window. I like the detail there of the cityscape at the bottom of the page. Johnson using um, white media there for the city lights and a screen tone there in the background for the nighttime sky. Very, very good stuff on these pages. So Natasha continues um, her leaping and bounding across the rooftops of Manhattan and she's making her way to Matt Murdock's brownstone. Another 1980s technique there, the color hold in the background showing the twin towers. And she, uh, as I said, like she makes her way into Matt Daredevil's brownstone because of course, uh, Black, the Black Widow and Daredevil were partners for a long time and romantic partners as well. So superhero partners and romantic partners. Nice choreography there of Black Widow moving in her distinctive style across those rooftop, rooftops. 
So she, uh, when she goes into the brownstone via the skylight, um, she discovers that um, Matt isn't around. And so she wonders about the basement and she said, thinks to herself, no, he never goes down there. And what are these two blades uh, waiting for her in the shadows? She doesn't um, hear anything or sense anything. She leaves that she need not die, think the two swordsmen. What of Stick? He's entranced with that other one, Daredevil. So are these agents of the hand? Are these hand nin ninjas um, that have come after Stick and Daredevil? They were chasing Stick in the previous issue. And now we turn the page and down in the basement, Daredevil's precisely there in a sensory deprivation tank. And we can see Stick sitting uh, cross-legged in the lotus position atop the tank. And he communicates telepathically with uh, Matt. So the two ninjas above um, are allies of Sticks. So they're not hand ninjas. And now uh, Stick communicates with his former pupil. Hear me, punk. So he's got a very lovely form of address for uh, Matt Murdock. And Murdock recognizes his voice. Teacher, but how? No questions, says uh, Stick curtly. Just tell me what's wrong with you this time. Just think it, I'll hear you. So Matt um, gives him an explanation about the recent uh, re-exposure to a radioactive agent, the same one that gave him his powers uh, the first time, the same isotope. And so his hypersenses have gone out of control. Then we pick up with Natasha again, and she's slipping up now. Um, she's caught on that um, television aerial and she's falling, but she's made her way to Heather Glenn's apartment. Heather Glenn is engaged to be married to Matt Murdock, and Black Widow wonders whether Matt might be there, but he's not, and Heather's drinking. Gotta hand it to you, Matt. You sure got a way of courting a lady? You destroy my dead father's business, rip my life into eensy weensy little pieces, leaving me nothing, nothing but you. And it doesn't look like she's best pleased, because of course, if she's got nothing but Matt, Matt isn't around. And let's continue with the story. This is a very pacey story, like we're moving along. Um, and here we have Kariji. He's been resurrected um, since the end of the previous issue. And his Jonan here gives a little uh, summary of Kariji's uh, long, long, long life. Um, his origins go back to feudal times in Japan. And now he presents uh, Kariji with his next target, and it is Stick. And this recalls uh, when Elektra received her commission from the hand to uh, uh, kill and assassinate um, Matt Murdock and then Foggy Nelson as well. This is the way the hand operates. They provide a Polaroid picture and then it uh, combusts so that there's no trace of the target. And the Jonan says to Kariji, he's our deadliest, most canny foe. His existence is an obstacle to the holy cause of the hand. End it. So um, the Black Widow has now made her way to the offices of Nelson and Murdoch in search of uh, Daredevil, and Becky and Foggy are there, and they haven't seen Dare they haven't seen Matt in days, and Foggy's getting irritated and suspicious. He vanishes for days at a time, then he pops up like nothing's happened. Sometimes I'm angry, sometimes I'm worried, sometimes I'm suspicious, says Foggy, and then we're back in the basement of Matt's brownstone, and Stick continues with his telepathic dialogue. How long are you planning on lying in there, punk? He questions Daredevil. Forever, I don't know, it's so loud out there. You've no idea how much it hurts. And Stick says to him, poor baby, you're gonna make me cry. Listen, punk, we got trouble. Of course we do, I'm, and it's not about Matt. Shut up, there's a ninja outfit called the hand, says Stick. You've messed with them once or twice. They want to kill me, me and some other folks. There's no time. And, and uh, Matt says, Stick, you came to me when I first acquired my hypersenses. You taught me to control them, but you never explained who you are. And the reader wants to know that too. And Stick says to him, look, there's no time for that. You've got to leave the tank now. Um, and Daredevil wants more instruction. What can I do? I'm helpless. No, says Stick, you're stupid. And then Stick is gone, so we just get this blank panel here, which is a really interesting storytelling technique. And he walks silently up the steps from the basement, leaving Matt in the sensory deprivation tank. 
And one of his team says to him, telepathically again, Stick, this is a mistake. Daredevil should not be involved. And Stick uh, demurs and he says, you're wrong. I trained each of you. So he's been a mentor to more than Matt Murdock. So listen, when I tell you, the punk would be as good at what we do as any of us, if only his head wasn't such a snake pit. Um, so really interesting stuff developing there. And now Natasha makes her way to surprisingly the offices of the Kingpin. And Kingpin is, uh, no pun intended, or perhaps there is, throwing his weight around with some of his underlings, just impressing his authority on them. And Natasha drops into the middle of that. So the thugs challenge her. And of course, Kingpin is just relaxed, smoking his cigar. And he asks her very nonchalantly, you are Natasha, about Daredevil. So she's there to find out, does Kingpin know where Daredevil is? And he responds, I have no idea where he's to be found. However, and I like this piece of characterization, Kingpin always on the lookout for a new assassin. However, if you seek employment, and then he realizes something's wrong with her. She's holding her head there. Turn the page. What is wrong with Natasha? Well, those toxins are kicking in and she's starting to discorporate. Kingpin thinks to himself, she's dissolving as she races out the door, but she's not weak enough that she can't disarm this thug with his machine gun there. And off she runs, the poison, it's finally. And all she can think about is Matt. She needs him. Does she want to tell him one last time that she still loves him? And then elsewhere, it's Kariji. And he is being, uh, he's being taken to Matt Murdock's brownstone residence. And he's making his way into the basement there, slipping in silently despite his huge bulk, somehow fitting between those iron bars. And then he arrives down, Stick is once again sitting atop the uh, sensory deprivation tank. So we get a really good sequence here. And something that has always stuck with me from this particular issue ever afterwards. So Stick continues saying to Matt, he's trying to exhort him to get out of the damn tank. You can leave the tank anytime you want to, punk. It's up to you. And Matt um, is in despair. He says, Stick, I told you it's the radiation. It's made every sound so loud, every smell so. And Stick just retorts, nah, that radiation's worn off by now, just like it did before. And this is the really interesting bit. Matt says, no, you're out of your mind, Stick. The radiation that gave me my powers never wore off. That's why I still have my hypersenses. Stick says, you don't know from nothing, punk. And Matt asks, what do you mean? And here we go. All that happened to you back then was that you got opened up to senses that everybody's got, but don't use. It ain't the radiation, never was. So the radiation just blinded young Matt Murdock is the implication of this. It never gave him superpowers. It never gave him a radar sense. He, the abilities he developed were abilities that everyone has that are latent and potential in everyone, most particularly some candidates like Matt, but they're not superpowers in the classic definition and then stick is gone so miller uses that trick again so we've got matt we can see his eyes wide open the telepathic link is broken and matt is wondering he wouldn't have cut me off just like that he wasn't finished explaining something must have happened to him so the man without fear will he truly act now without fear again but he goes into the fetal position in the sensory deprivation tank i can't go out there i won't he says it hurts out there, so noisy, I, I'm scared. But he is pulling the uh, oxygen mask off his face. So we got to take something away from that. Now turn the page, what's happening out here? Well, he's pushing up the lid of the sensory deprivation tank and he can hear two heartbeats. And Stick has grabbed between the palms of his hands, Kariji's samurai sword. And he calls out, Shaft, get the man's attention. And three arrows stick in Kariji's back. Your move, Claw. And another ninja attacks Kariji, kicking him right in the jaw. And he's bearing those claws um, that give him his code name. Okay, Claw says stick. Back off now. He's a quick one. Stone. And Stone is there with the sword. And he basically takes Kariji's sword away from him and stabs him right through the chest. And so now it's revealed that um, that Stick's uh, team, 
wear different robes, white robes, white robes for the good guys and red for the murderous um, hand assassins. So Stick says to his team, you'll have to destroy the body. And of course, Matt is bewildered. Stick, who, what I mean? Guess I better explain. Okay, so we're gonna get an explanation from Stick, but there's an interruption. Matt, now what? Ask Stick, turn the page. We know who it's going to be. It is Black Widow, and she's stumbling down the steps of the basement that she was in earlier. And look at her, she's dissolving. Great imagery. Um, on this particular final page and use of white negative space as well in Miller's layouts. Next, Siege. And here we go. Instead of a letters page, we have an explanation for readers as to what happened with um, the arts, the art credits. We interrupt our regularly scheduled letter column for a few words of explanation. After establishing his credentials as one of the boldest, most innovative embellishers to work in comics, Klaus Janssen has come to try his able hand at penciling, and the last few issues have amply demonstrated his success. Working over designs furnished by writer Frank Miller, Klaus now brings his vision to the total look and texture of Daredevil. For a peek over their shoulders, check out the original 8.5 by 11 inch sketch by Frank that is reproduced below, and compare it to this issue's splash page. You'll see that for Klaus, and for Daredevil, the fun has only just started. So this is what Miller is providing Klaus Janssen. This is the rough um, thumbnail. And because it's a splash page, it's big, but uh, the uh, other pages with more panels, the art would be small. Janssen is um, blowing it up with a Xerox machine, and then he's using it as a guide for his own pencils. So the visual storytelling, the layouts, including the placements of letters, is and credits and so on and so forth is Miller's. Miller is the visual designer of the comic. And let's just flip back to that splash page. Have a look there at the sharpness of the cheekbones there in Miller's rendition of the Black Widow. And then see how Jansen has interpreted that. He softened out the face there, you can see that. So I do hope that you enjoyed this review and commentary on Daredevil number 188. Let me know your thoughts on this in the comment section to the video. If you enjoyed my review, please like the video on YouTube. It really does help the channel and consider sharing it too. And if you haven't done so already, subscribe to the channel and stay tuned for more content like this.